So we're being brought into, as Kitavo says, Kitavo means when you come or enter into the land and the entire Parsha is from Deuteronomy 26.1 to 29.8. And so it's Vehaya uh, Kitavo uh, El Haaretz. And when it shall be, when you come into the land, Vehaya speaks of the future, when it shall be and when it will happen. Kitavo, when you are come, El Haaretz, into the land. So when we look at this Parsha, we're going to see a lot of different elements. It's not as long as the last one where you had all 75 mitzvot, a lot of commandments in that last one. I spent a lot of time rushing through them. But here you've got a few. So in an overview of this whole Parsha, the Israelites are commanded to bring the first of their first fruits to the temple. Now, I speak more of this when we get closer to the spring feast. Now we are approaching the fall feast right now. So in the spring feast, you've got your Passover. Immediately after sundown, after your Passover, it starts a seven day period of what? Unleavened bread. So you had Passover, then you had unleavened bread. And the day after the Sabbath, question between the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, what Sabbath are we talking about? Are we talking about the first Sabbath? That is of unleavened bread, the first day and the last day are Sabbaths. Or are we talking about the first weekly Sabbath after Passover? That's where the Pharisees and the Sadducees had a disagreement. But whatever that is, that is known as first fruits. Now we know that our Lord Yeshua resurrected after the Passover, didn't he? And he actually resurrected on the day that the Sadducees said it was, the day after the weekly Sabbath. So tonight, once sundown hit, we're in the first day of the week. So Yeshua would have had to have raised from the dead after sundown. Let's say that we were back then at that time in that year. Then after sunset tonight, then Yeshua would have risen from the dead. Doesn't have to be Sunday. It could have been any time after sundown, Saturday night. So Yeshua is, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, he's the first fruits of the what? He's the first fruits of the dead. So Yeshua being the first fruits of the dead, that's on Yom Habikarim. Then you've got another Yom Habikarim. That is this one that we're talking about right here in uh, Deuteronomy 26. Now Yom Habikarim, the day of first fruits, that's the one that Yeshua rose from the dead on the day after the Shabbat. He rose on Yom Habikarim. Now, Passover isn't technically over until we're in Sinai. That's in the Jewish mind or the Hebrew mindset. So Passover, which began, you know, a few days earlier than when Yeshua resurrected, Passover, which began, started a count the day after Shabbat. There is a count in the counting of the Omer that occurs how many days is it between, from the time of the uh, day after the Sabbath day to the time of this feast called Shavuot. 50 days. 50 days. That's why it's known in the Greek as Pentecost. Yeah. So now you've got a Yom Habikarim, the day after the Sabbath of Passover. Are you with me? 50 days later, by count. You had to count it. 50 days later, there's another Yom Habikarim. So you have at the beginning of the book, you got it on the cover of the book, you've got Yom HaBikarim. 50 days later, if you, you know, analogize it as a book, at the very end you've got the closing, which is also Yom HaBikarim. They're tied together by two things. One, they're tied together by a count. You are not to the other Yom HaBikarim or Pentecost until you have counted the 50 days. Then they're also tied together by name. Yom Habikarim, Yom Habikarim, they're tied together by name too. Which means they're literally, that whole period is where we're doing the count of the Omer. We are actually still dealing with the beginning and end of the same feast. Bringing your first fruits. Then when they're brought, they're brought where? Where are all your offerings? Where are all your first fruits going to be brought? To Jerusalem. So that was our Ramez, Hamakom, the place that you're going to bring them. The place is, as we see in Deuteronomy 26, verse number 2, this place is where the Lord is choosing to put his name. That is Jerusalem. So here we are now. 
looking at that, and we'll talk more about that in the springtime. Because next year we still have a Passover. And what's going to happen next year at Passover? Blood what happened this year at Passover? Blood a blood moon. We're coming up to the Sukkot Tabernacles next month. What happens on Sukkot this year? Blood moon. Blood moon. Then next year, what happens on Passover next year? Blood moon. Blood moon. What happens on Sukkot next year? Blood moon. Blood moon. So in Sukkot, this year we're going to see another blood moon, the second of four. And Passover 2015, we're going to see the third of four. And then on Sukkot 2015, we're going to see the last of the tetrad. Is that kind of like saying verily, verily? Or it's more than verily, 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 verily it is. <laughs> in history, when was the last blood moon? Pardon? The last blood moon that it was. Well, the last blood moons were in the 64... Well, that's a tetrad. War. A tetrad, that's what it is. Four. There have been a lot of tetrads. 2008, yeah. I think. In 2012, there was a ribbon one. I'm just saying, there's a difference between... Oh, there are tetrad, yeah, yeah, yeah. Moons. Okay, there have been hundreds of blood moons or tetrads but since the first century. Five in a row. But no, no. Four. Actually... When it falls on a biblical holy day, this also confirms the very fact that Leviticus 23 is still valid. Right. Leviticus 23 are the holy days. Ever since there have been only seven other blood moons, tetrads, that have fallen on biblical holy days. Only seven since the first century. This is the eighth. Now if you count, you know, use Jewish numerology, then what seven means is completeness. What eight means is renewal. What is going to be the renewal? You know, I think you hinted upon that. We're going to see a new heavens and a new earth. And we're going to see the millennial reign of Yeshua, you know, as we're moving down that road. What is going to be new? Well, we're going to go into the messianic reign. The seven year, you know, the seven, one thousand year. We've had 6,000 years of man's rule. Look at where it gets us. Then we're going into the messianic reign where Yeshua is going to reign and rule. That is going to have to happen right after the last blood moon. Because Joel tells us that there's going to be moon, you know, blood moons and there's going to be eclipses. What's really interesting in this last tetrad that's coming up, the eighth one, the first two blood moons, you know, we've already had one, Passover, now it's coming up in Sukkot. And then the next two blood moons, Passover next year, Sukkot next year. Between these first two and the next two blood moons, there's a solar eclipse in between them. So you've got the sun turning dark, just like it says in the prophetic. And blessed are the eyes that see what we see. We're seeing the Lord is going to come pretty soon. So also in this is Moses explaining about the blessing and cursings to be pro proclaimed on two mountains, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, when Israel enters the land. And then we're going to see the blessings and the cursings. Let's talk really quickly about the first Aliyah. I think I, I beat that almost to death. But the first Aliyah is the mitzvah of Bikarim, first fruits. We already talked about that. That applies only to the fruits and the produce grown in the land. It doesn't apply to anything grown outside of the land. So if you wanted to keep this, you'd better be in the land and you bring your first fruits. That will happen when there's a temple. Shavuot, Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, Leviticus 23. I think I already t uh, talked about that. After you enter the land, I'm giving you and harvest its ripe, crop, crop, ripe crops. You're to bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And it's to be done the day after the Shabbat. I already talked about the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then from the day after the day of rest, whatever that Sabbath day is, was it the uh, first day of unleavened bread or was it the weekly Sabbath? Then you got to count seven full weeks to 50 days and then you have the new grain offering. Both of these are called Yom, the day Habikrim of first fruits. And it was a type of terumah, which was a uh, akin but distinct from a uh, agricultural tithe. This was something that was brought. Uh, and we're going to talk more about that. We will talk about that next year when we approach uh, uh, Yom HaBikri. And then we do our account of the uh, Omer. So 
we have that commandment then, which we find here in Deuteronomy 26. Then we're moving on. I'm going to move on. The second aliyah. We see that during those temple times, the Israelite farmers were required to separate from their produce different types of tithes. One was given to the priest, the other to a Levite, then the poor, and one tithe was eaten by its owners in Jerusalem. So how was that done? Was that done in one year? No, it was done in a three year cycle. So when they did bring their tithes, it was to specific purposes and it was done on a three year cycle. So it doesn't move you into poverty when you're doing these things. So the Torah gives us the procedure to be followed on the day before Passover during those years, which followed the conclusion of the three year cycle. And that's when the farmer is to declare he's done all that he is supposed to be doing, and then he asks God to bless his people in the land. The third aliyah admonishes Israel to observe God's commandments. Now we have seen this repeated over and over and over again in this book of Deuteronomy. The whole idea is the reason why we were still in the wilderness for 40 years is because what? We didn't listen to God and do what God wanted us to do. So over and over again, as Moses approaches the last days of his life, by the way, uh, the book of De Deuteronomy, the entire book was given in the last few weeks of Moses' life before he was going to die on the mountain. So over and over again, Moses admonishes the Israelites to keep God's commandments, reminding them that, they've been select that they have selected him to be their God and that he has chosen them to be a holy and treasured nation. Now, I'm going to just touch upon it. I've written a couple of books on the subject on holiness. One was a call to holiness, and it does have a strong title, and that is speaking to the church about leaving Harlot Babylon. Now, one of the things you'll note in Deuteron or Revelation, excuse me, in Revelation chapter 12, in verse number 17, you're going to see that the dragon, that is Satan, is infuriated with the woman, that's Israel and goes off to fight against the rest of her children. Well, those are those who believe in our Lord Yeshua. You'll see this coming up right now. Those who obey God's commandments and bear witness to Yeshua. So there's two criteria here that the enemy is coming against. One is that the people that the enemy is coming against are against those who keep God's commands. And the next one is they bear witness to Yeshua. Now think about it this way. Does God repeat himself just for the fun of it? No. It's like when Yeshua said amen and amen. Well then go to chapter 14 of Revelation with me, verse 12. And that's where it says, when this is when perseverance is needed on the part of God's people. Those who observe his commandments and exercise faith in our Lord Yeshua. Now he said that twice. And the question is, what do the commandments do? Well, as God says, be holy as I'm holy. Why are we observing the biblical Sabbath from Friday evening to Saturday evening? Because what? Remember the Vashamra? It's because God rested on the seventh day. And that goes from Saturday night to Sunday night sundown. No, excuse me. Friday night. Boink. Made a boo-boo. We'll just illuminate that little boo-boo, okay? No guarantees. <laughs> <laughs> no guarantees. Anyhow, Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown. That is the biblical Sabbath. It has not changed. God is still reminding us from his word to do what I did. Well, God knows what day he rested. And God shared it with Moses, and we have it found very clearly in the Torah. The question that runs into our minds, and I'm going to sit directly to 2 Peter chapter 3. What is this about keeping God's commandments, and what does that do? Well, number one, if we go to 2 Peter chapter 3, and we recognize that the time is short. And that's what Peter is trying to emphasize here. He says, dear friends, I'm writing you now the second letter. And in both letters, I'm trying to arouse you to wholesome thinking by means of reminders. 
so that you will keep in mind the predictions of the holy prophets and the command given by the Lord to deliver through your emissaries or apostles. So what is the purpose of this? Well, he's trying to rouse within God's people wholesome thinking to remind us about the predictions of the prophets. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. Blessed are the ears that hear what you hear. For many prophets and kings long to see these things. You see, we're living in times. We're living in the last days. And the prophets and kings saw all this, albeit from afar. But we're now in these last days. So consider that we're now in the last days. What Peter's trying to emphasize to us, number th- uh, verse 3, understand this. During the last days, scoffers will come, following their own desires and asking, where is this promise coming of his? For our fathers have died and everything goes on just as it has since the beginning of creation. But wanting so much to be right about this, they overlooked the fact that it was by God's word that long ago there were the heavens and there was land which arose out of the water and existed between the waters and that by means of these things the world of that time was flooded with water and destroyed. It is by that same word that the present heavens and earth having been preserved are being kept for fire until the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. What are we finding in this world today? We're finding skeptics all over the place. Yeah, you know, we've heard about the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, so many times, well, he hasn't come yet. Well, ever since Peter, he hasn't come yet. Now, there are some that say that he's down in uh, Brooklyn, New York, in the Watchtower. Not. (laughs) Now, listen to the words that he speaks to us, because we're watching these things, we're seeing these things, we're hearing these things. Verse 8, Moreover, dear friends, don't ignore this. With one, uh, excuse me, with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some people think of slowness. On the contrary, he's patient with you. For it is not his purpose that anyone should be destroyed, but that everyone should turn from his sins. Now, we're in the month of Elul. Elul is just before Tishri. In this month of Elul, we should be repenting and turning from our sins. This is the time. And particularly between Rosh Hashanah, which starts next week, and the Yom Kippur. Those are known as the days of awe. If we haven't done our repenting and asking God forgiveness and stuff like that for our sins, We should be doing it for sure between that period. And Peter goes on to say, However, the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and on that day the heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will melt and disintegrate, and the earth and everything in it will be burned up. Now he's speaking ahead. Remember prophets. They're standing on the mountaintops, looking down at other mountaintops down the way, and they're seeing bits and pieces of what's going on, or what's going to happen. Now, Peter goes on to say, since everything is going to be destroyed like this, now this is the question for all of us. If we are part of those that the enemy is going to persecute, even unto death, then we need to hear these words. Since everything is going to be destroyed like this, what kind of people should you be? Answer. You should lead holy and godly lives as you wait for the day of God and work to hasten its coming. That day will bring on destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt from the heat. But we, following along with his promise, wait for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness will be at home. Therefore, dear friends, as you look for these things, do everything you can to be found by him without spot or defect and at peace. What we need to be looking at in our lives, and I don't need to be looking at the brother and says, hey, brother, you know, this is not you know, holy living in line with everything that the Torah commands. Who should I be looking most of all? What should my glasses be most? Instead of lenses to look through them, they should be mirrors to look back at me and my sins and looking at it as James would say, look in that mirror, the perfect Torah, and see who I really am. Because when I start pointing a finger at somebody else, I've got three of them pointing back at me. I need to get my life right with God. 
I don't live your life. Each one of us is accountable, if you're young or bar botanist for the age, in the thinking of the Hebrew mind, you are accountable for your own sins before God. So how should you be walking? Well, how do you know what holy is? Well, Paul tells us. So here's how we're going to find out what holy lives are. Romans 7, 12. So the Torah. Now, the Torah encompasses more for us than it uh, did uh, back even in the time of Paul. Because we didn't have the New Testament writings. But back in the time of Paul, all they had were the two main divisions. Three, I should say. The Torah... That's the first five books of Moses. The Nevi'im, that's the prophets. And the Ketuvim, that's the writings. That's all they had. They had what we call the Hebrew Bible, or Old Testament. So what is it that tells us what holy is? Well, that's the Torah. That the commandment is holy, just, and good. If you are amongst those that are being persecuted by the devil, what are you doing? You're keeping what? The commandments of God. Do you know what the Antichrist is known as? The lawless one. Anomia. A in Greek means not or no. Nomos means law. The lawless one. The anomia one. What is he against? He's against God's commandments. He will not live according to the Torah, the prophets, or the writings. Romans 7. What is it that tells us what we're doing is sinful or not? How do we know whether what we're doing is sin? Well, Torah is not sinful. There is a lot of theology in the church today that says Torah, you know, is the law of sin and death. Well, that's not what Romans says. Paul says that Torah is not sinful. The function of the Torah was that without it, I wouldn't have known what sin was. So I wouldn't have known what greed was, or adultery was, or murder was, or any of that stuff as a sin, unless the Torah said it. First John 3. John says it easy. Complete Jewish Bible. Everyone who keeps sinning, that's practicing sin, is violating the Torah. Indeed, sin is the violation of Torah. In the King James, it says, whoever commits sin transgresses against the law, for, the, for sin is the transgression of the law. So if you wanted to know what sin is, where do you go? You go to Torah. On the obverse, if you want to know what holy means, where do you go? See, if you take away that standard, it would be like me having a, a tape measure that is in there accurate, and you have one that's accurate, and we measure out a foot, Yours is different than mine. You know, the scripture says you have to have honest weights and measures. So my measure, if it's going to be honest, has to be the same foot length as his. Or three feet, or whatever, 25 feet. The standard's the same. The standard is Torah. If you violate Torah, you are what? Sinning. If you keep Torah, you are walking holy. Now that's your choice. You choose to do what you choose. Holy means to be separate from. And we're to be in the world, but we're not to be of the world. Yeshua prayed in his high priestly uh, prayer in John 17. He says, I've given them your word. He's speaking to the Father. He's praying to the Father. And the world hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I myself do not belong to the world. I don't ask you to take them out of the world, but to protect them from the evil one. Well, who's the one that's going to be coming against us according to Revelation 12 and Revelation 14? The evil one. And he's going to send his emissaries to do all the dirty work. And I do believe Islam is a part of it. Now, speaking about us, they do not belong to the world just as I don't belong to the world. Now, here's how we're going to be set apart for holiness. I said, we got to be set apart. Verse 17 of John 17. Set them apart for holiness by means of the truth. Your word is truth. So if we want to know what truth is, and we say this in the blessed, who gave us your Torah of truth. Well, who does the Torah of truth speak about? The one who is the way, Haderic, the truth, Haemet, and the life, Hachai. The way, the truth, and the life. This word is truth, and it speaks of Yeshua, who is the way, the truth, and life. Just as you sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. On their behalf, I'm setting myself apart for holiness. 
Why does he set himself apart for holiness? Well, for our benefit. So that they too may be set apart for holiness. He's doing what he wants us to do. That's why we're supposed to be disciples of his. A Talmud does just what the master does. We've lost sight of that. We lost sight in the body of Messiah, of a holy Messiah. Now, to give you the example from the days of the rabbis of just how far would a Talmud, a disciple, do to be able to do what the master does, I'll give you an example. It is written in the rabbinical writings. There was a Talmud that was standing outside of the outhouse where the rabbi was. And he was jumping up and down trying to look into the hole to see how the master <coughs> was relieving himself so that he could do what the master was doing even in the most mundane thing that could be done in life. So as you're sitting on the throne, who are you you're supposed to be emulating? The one who is on the throne. <laughs> Holiness is not just some arbitrary thing. Holiness is defined for us within the Torah, within the prophets, and within the writings. It's been defined for us. So what should we be doing? To follow the Master? We need to do what the Master did. Even in the most mundane things of life. Why did he come down to this earth? To be like us? To be in the form of a body like us? So he can do exactly what he wants us to do. And I do believe this. He had to go to the bathroom sometime. But I don't think we have anything written about it in the gospel accounts. I guess thankfully. But he sets himself, our Lord Yeshua set himself apart for holiness for our sake by means of the truth. So we're set apart. We're to be set apart from the world. We're to be in the world. But it's kind of like this. How can you walk through a pigsty without getting any of the pig poop on your feet? How can you do that? Well, our Lord Yeshua did. Where did he go? Who did he talk to? He talked to the low lowlifes of his society of that day. He talked to the lepers. You don't do that. He talked to the prostitutes. You didn't do that. He even talked to a Samaritan woman. You didn't do that if you were an Orthodox Jewish man, and you wouldn't do it today. He talked to the ones that others would look down upon so that we could look at him and not look down upon them too. Because the rest of the society, whatever they choose to do, that's what they're going to do. How are we to be? But we're to be like the master. So the standard of holiness is the word of God. The fourth aliyah. When we were crossing the Jordan River, we were instructed to gather large stones. The large stones were to be plastered, and the entire Torah was to be engraved upon them. One set of so stones was to be inscribed with the entire Torah on Mount Gerizim. The other set on Mount Ebal. Interestingly, if you go to Deuteronomy 27, if you want to follow me, uh, the Hebrew people are instructed to proclaim blessings and cursings on Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. The elders of the Levite tribe, together with the Holy Ark, stood between the two mountains. Anybody remember what little town was between those two mountains? Shechem, which means shoulders. Shechem was on the shoulders of Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Now, the blessings were to be pronounced on Mount Gerizim, and the curses were to be pronounced on Mount Ebal. Now, here's how it goes. Mount Gerizim is south, there's Shechem, then you've got Mount Ebal, the curses. In between these two mountains was sort of a natural amphitheater where Shechem is. And what was to happen were the plastered stones on Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal with the Torah being written on them, are going to be up here, and the blessings were to be pronounced from Mount Gerizim and the curses on Mount Ebal. Shechem is exactly the place where that was to be. And it's done in the book of Joshua. We're going to see the ark was right smack in the middle between the two mountains on, in, Mount, in Shechem. Excuse me. Joshua was down here. The elders and the priests were down across here. 
Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin were on Mount Gerizim. Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali were on Mount Ebal. So what we've got here is the blessings and the curses being repeated. So now you've got a map. Mount Gerizim's on the bottom, Shechem's in the middle, Mount Ebal is on the north. So you've got the curses on Mount Ebal, Mount Gerizim is on the bottom. Now, before we go on to that, the next part of this, the blessings are on Mount Gerizim and the curses on Mount Ebal. Now, going back to this picture that we see here. If you go with me to John chapter 4, you're going to see that um, Yeshua sets himself in a little town in Shamron, which is known as Samaria. That little town is called Shechem, verse number 5 of John 4. Who did he meet there? He met a woman at the well. Notice what time it was, verse 6. It was about noon. Kind of hot. Kind of a hot day for a woman to be at the well drawing water. Because it was woman's work. We talked about that back in the book of Genesis. It was woman's work to carry water. Why was this woman, a Samaritan woman, at this well at noon? On the hottest time of the day. When the women normally would be drawing the water at the cool of the day in the morning. So they wouldn't make fun of her. Why would they make fun of her? Because she was? Prostitute. She was either a prostitute or living in illicit relationships. Five husbands, five husbands and the last one wasn't a husband. And she was amazed. Now notice what she says to him. This is really interesting. He asked for water. And verse 9, she's asking him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for water? A woman of Samaria. Yeshua said, if you knew God's gift, that is, who it is saying to you, give me a drink of water, then you would have asked him. And he would have given you mayim chayim, living water. And Yeshua said, uh, excuse me, she said, verse 11, Sir, you don't have a bucket, and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Yaakov, Jacob, are you? He gave us this well and drank from it, and so did his son that's in his cattle, uh, cattle. Well, think about it too. It wasn't just Jacob centuries earlier. Who else was on this mountain pronouncing the blessings? Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. All of these were on that mountain. Here you've got it where Joshua, who is the prototype of Yeshua bringing the people into the land, the blessings are going to come from Mount Gerizim. Where do the Samaritans still, still, there aren't as many of them anymore, where are they offering sacrifices? Gerizim? Yep, Mount Gerizim. So they're offering sacrifices on this, and, you know, our Lord goes ahead and said, uh, after she says this, verse 19, Sir, I can see that you're a prophet. The woman replied, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. Why? Because it's associated in the minds of the people later, centuries later, as being what? The mountain of blessing. Isn't that the one you want to be on? Why wasn't it on Mount Ebal? Because that's where the curses were. We like to associate ourselves with God in the blessings. But we don't like to associate ourselves with God in his cursings. In our Parsha today, you're going to find that in chapter 11, verses 26 to 32, you're going to go ahead and find that there were blessings that were pronounced on Mount Gerizim. There it is in Shamron, Samaria. And that's where the fathers worshipped. That's where the um, Samaritans still offer uh, sacrifices. So now you've got the curses on Mount Ebal. And Joshua did this, and I don't have time to go through that, but you can read it, Joshua 8, 30 to 35. They did exactly what Moses said needed to be done there. And that's exactly what they did. Moving on to the sixth aliyah. I want to get there. The section continues with the mentioned blessings and then launches a lengthy description of all the bad things, so the curses. Now, if you want to follow with me on that, go to chapter 28. You go to chapter 28. 
Beginning verse 1, it says, If you listen closely to what Adonai your God says, observing and obeying all his mitzvot, his commandments that I'm giving you today, then all the following blessings will be yours in abundance. A blessing on you in the city, verse 3. A blessing on you in the countryside, verse 4. A blessing on the fruit of your body, the fruit of your land, the fruit of your livestock, the young of your cattle and flocks, 5. A blessing on your grain basket and kneading bowl, 6. A blessing on you when you go out and a blessing on you when you come in. Verse 7, Adonai will cause your enemies attacking you to be defeated before you. They will advance on you one way and flee before you seven ways. Verse 8, Adonai will order a blessing to be with you in your barns and everything you undertake. He will bless you in the land Adonai has given you. Verse 9, Adonai will establish you as a people separated for himself. That's what holiness is about. As he has sworn to you, if you will observe the mitzvot of Adonai your God and follow his ways. That's conditional. If you obey these mitzvot, then all the people of the earth will see that the Lord's name, his presence is with you so that they'll be afraid of you. Verse 11, Adonai will give you great abundance of good things, the fruit of your body, the fruit of your livestock, the fruit of your land rain, everything. If you listen to verse number 13, observe and obey the mitzvot of Adonai. And not turning away from any of the words I'm ordering you today, neither to the right or to the left, to follow after other gods and serve them. Now, that's it. That's the blessings. Follow with me on the cursings. All the way from verse number 15, all the way to verse number... Sixty-nine. They are all curses. Oh, but God is only wanting to bless his people only a little bit. The curses seem to be out outweighing the blessings. God doesn't want to bless his people a whole lot. It looks here from the quantity of the curses. God wants to really curse and really inflict pain upon his people, right? No. Because we talked about this earlier. God doesn't want to do that. He wants to bless. Now follow with me on why is the magnitude of the cursing outnumbering the blessings. Go with me to Leviticus chapter 25. We have to be quick. <laughs> oh, Leviticus 25. I wish I had more time. But it goes ahead beginning in verse number... Uh-oh. Did I do a typo or what? I did. Leviticus chapter 26. It should be 26. Change that in your handout. Go with me to verse number 18. Now it starts with the blessings and it uses the same kind of ratio here. But since I don't have the time to go over all those blessings again, let's start at 18. If these things don't make you listen to me, what things? Well, he starts in verse number 14, and he's saying, If you don't listen to me and obey all these mitzvot, if you loathe my regulations and reject my rulings in order not to obey all my mitzvot but cancel my covenant, then I, for my part, will do this to you. I will bring terror upon you, wasting disease, chronic fever to dim your sight and sap your strength. You will sow your seed for nothing because your enemies will eat the crops. I will set my face against you. Your enemies will defeat you and those who hate you will hound you and you will flee when no one is pursuing you. Now that's the beginning. What is the cause of God beginning to change and put the curses on the people? Their disobedience. Look at verse number 18. Well, if you don't listen to me then, then what is God going to do? Discipline. Discipline them seven times more. I love them seven times more. Then look at verse 21. If they still don't listen to him, more. seven times more. Look at verse 23. If in spite of all this, you still refuse to accept my correction, seven times more. Then it goes ahead and says in verse 27, and if for all this you still won't listen to me, but go against me, then I will go against you furiously, and I will chastise you yet seven times more. What then is the purpose of all these curses upon Israel? To get them to do what? To get them to repent to make Teshuvah and come back to God. Isn't that kind of what Peter was talking about? You're seeing all these things happening? 
God doesn't want to destroy everybody. He doesn't want to send them to eternal damnation. What is his purpose about bringing all these plagues that you see in the book of Revelation? What is his purpose? To get men to curse him? No. To get them to repent. <coughs> How appropriate of a time of the year this is in the month Elul. Finally, with five minutes remaining, four actually, the seventh Aliyah. Why should we listen to any of this at all? The reason why we should listen is because we see God's hands at work. Actually, they see God's hands at work. It's really interesting when you get to this part of Deuteronomy. We're almost at the very end. It's very interesting to see how he reminds them what has happened in the past. You know, this is the second generation. This is not the generation that actually left Egypt. All have died in the wilderness, except for Joshua, Caleb, and at this moment, Moses. That's it. I want you to go with me to the next Parsha, where we're going to be entering in. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 28, or 29, excuse me. In verse number 9. It's known as Parsha Nitzavim, standing. And listen to whom it is being addressed. If you think this is just for them, that them, there's another thing coming. And that is Deuteronomy 29.10. Today you are standing, Nitzavim, all of you, before Adonai, your God, your heads, your tribes, your leaders, and your officers, all the men of Israel, along with your little ones, your wives, your foreigners here. Caleb is a foreigner. With you in your camp. From the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water. Okay? This covers everybody. Everybody. The purpose, verse 11, is that you should enter into the covenant of Adonai your God and into his oath, which Adonai your God is making with you today, so that he can establish you today for himself as a people. What's God's desire with every one of us? To establish us as his people. That's his desire today. What's Peter talking about? Why should we be living holy lives in these last days? Why should we be living these kind of lives so other people can see us living the life? So people can start to ask the question, why are you what you're doing? Why do you live the way you do? You can share with them because I'm following after my Lord Yeshua, Jesus, that you know. How come you don't have all those boils on your skin? And <laughs> yeah, when you get to Revelation, you're going to see that. Yep. So that he can establish you today for himself as a people, and so that for you he will be God. There's no other gods. As he said to you, and as he swore to your ancestors, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, now I'm going to get to us, the rest of the story. But I'm not making this covenant and this oath only with you. That is the people who are standing there that day. Rather, I am making it both with him who is standing here with us today before Adonai, our God, and also with him who is not here with us today. What verse is that? 15. Chapter 29, verse 14. Or if you're in the Christian Bible, verse 15. I know it gets confusing. Who is he speaking to? He's speaking to the ones who are gathered there, listening to these words. No acceptance. Everybody's there fits into one of these categories. Then it goes on to say, to us speaking, to, he's speaking to us today. But I'm not making this covenant and this oath only with you. Rather, I'm making it both with him who is standing with us here today, before Adonai our God, and also with him who is not here with us today. More about that next Shabbat. Put a little hook in your mouth. Maybe you'll come back next week.